Good morning, Coach Chapel. Good morning. How's everybody today? It's a good day to be at Coach Chapel, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. See these pews filling up, filling up, filling up. We're going to have to move to the bigger sanctuary before long, aren't we? Amen. Yeah, our two <laughs> Hey, easy now. <laughs>
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're so excited to be here today. Lord, what a blessing to be in your house with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we are here in freedom. We're not having to hide in an underground church today like many of our brothers and sisters across the world. And Lord, we want to pray for them. We want to pray for you to give them strength, protection, courage. Lord, to let them feel your mighty, mighty presence. Thank you, Lord, that we are never away from your spirit. You are with us at all times. There is never a second that you do not see us, that you do not watch over us, and that you do not love us. Lord, we love you so much. And today, we enter into your praise and your worship. May you take it, Lord. May it bring a smile to your face and just use it however you choose by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in your name we pray, precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 98 to God be the Lord. Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection. 
And I'll ask those that can help with offering, if you would come forward. Uh, I just wanted to share as well uh, some, some good news coming down uh, the hatch in a few weeks. We're going to consider stewardship as we prepare for, this is everyone's favorite, right? As we prepare for 2023. And 2023, I'm sure there are no financial uncertainties that you need to worry about. But so specifically, something, a time, a season of time, three weeks specifically, between October 2nd and October 16th, I want you to, to pay attention and consider what you might, uh, what you might pledge is the, the typical word, but what you might offer of yourself financially for 2023. We have many, many new ministries that we would like to uh, like to begin and like to create, um, like to start brand new, um, start to bring back again. And quite frankly, it takes a little bit of resource to get there and to get the, the motor churning. Um, and so all of that is a part of that process. We're going to have a special October 16th ending and a big surprise and meal and that kind of deal. And I would love to invite you all to that. That will be a a brunch in the worship center together around the table. Um, but be, be in prayer about that. Be in prayer for this church. Um, I always say before we give, give of your time, give of your resources. Remember your baptismal and your membership vows. To be, to be witnesses. That's the last one that's added. To, be, to give of your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And that's, that's all I'm asking. Is that we consider what we've already said. We'll consider Will you pray with me? Holy and precious God, we give you thanks. We know that this is your church. We pray that we would be your people. God, help us today to listen to you, to trust you in all things. And God, we pray that as you have given to us so, so gratefully, so graciously, and so abundantly, that we might have some kind of giving in kind, that we might offer of what we have, our strength, our creativity, anything that we have in our possession, that we might offer it up to you. That your kingdom on earth would be as it is in heaven. That we would teach this world heavenly principles for a, a world and, and a time in need. Each of us need. Not only this year, but next year. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Ms. Ching. Thank you, Caroline. Turn those pages. Thank you. It's a good one, right? Hey, it takes everybody uh, to do what, what you all do. I appreciate you. Uh, we will pray. Will we pray? Yes. Will we be a praying church? Will we be a church that actually takes time and, and prays? Uh, I, I want to share one, one little thing about well, what is prayer. And you might hopefully hear a little bit more, but my sermon, oddly, is, is less about exactly what prayer is and more about what, what maybe was happening in that time in the book of Timothy. So I just want to share right now before we pray, what, what are we doing here? Well, what is this season when we have a pastoral prayer? What is prayer? And I, I think that sometimes we get this idea that God is really like a genie. And we, if we rub just the right way, that, that we might move God to do what we like. You know what I mean? I think that sometimes we also have this idea that if, if we don't, then God won't do what we like. I, I, but I have to push back on that at least a little bit. And the fact that a prayer, I think, is really opening our own heart of being receptive to who God is. Being receptive and saying, right here, right now, I, I don't want human opinions anymore. I want a direct channel with you. I'm going to open up my heart. I'm going to soften my heart. I'm going to posture my heart to receive you. And when you pray, that is that the power of prayer is that we are open to the power of God. The power of prayer is that when we really pray, we are opening ourselves to the power of God and what God can do in and through you. Amen? Amen. With that in mind, let us pray and go to God, opening up our hearts. Holy and precious God, I pray that, that the words of my mouth and that the meditations of our hearts, that they would truly be pleasing to you. Otherwise, all of this is, is nothing but a noisy gong. All of this would just be a charade if it wasn't really about you. We pray that our, our hearts would, would be open and seeking your principles, your heavenly ways for us each and every day. We pray that we might teach our hearts to tune in to you. There's like a certain divine frequency. It's strange. It's on that weird AM radio area that we need to tune the dial a little further. But if we can tune our hearts to that frequency that is your voice, we have to cloud out, declutter the noise to hear your voice. And God, I... I pray that that is what we're doing when we pray. Show us, teach us, your faithful people, what it means to be prayer warriors. What the power of prayer is, the power that's you, that's alive and working in our hearts and in our midst. And we ask for it even in this moment. In your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Today, and I believe I've opened the big Bible to 1 Timothy, right? Hopefully you can see that. And 1 Timothy has, has a lot of, of truth, I think, for us today. 1 Timothy, of course, is a, is a, a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Um, and so that's why it's called Timothy. <laughs> You're so smart. Like that. <laughs> That's seminary for you. <laughs> Will you please stand as we read? <laughs> oh, help me today, Jesus. <laughs> Will you stand as we read this, this powerful letter to Timothy? This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings, 
and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and acceptable before God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ. Himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Amen. Uh, this is a good... A good letter. It has a lot of uh, a lot for us. Imagine if you were in a world in the first century. You've come to know Jesus. You you saw Jesus working in your life as an apostle, and then sort of previous generations that that began after you started to see this way, the way at work in your town, in your families, that you started seeing people come to the faith. You started seeing people that normally were rejected in towns and had to get their water at noon come to see that there's a Messiah who is still seeing even you and forgiving even you. Come to the defense of adulterers on a dusty byway where people were ready to stone places where, where even tax collectors who were trying to climb trees to get a view were somehow brought into the fold of the community again. And this shaped people in such a way that, that even these tax collectors decided to give back four times the amount that was taken because they wanted to do right not only by God, but by the people they had wronged. And it was in the name of Jesus that these things were happening in places. And Hearts were being changed and transformed, but there was a lot of friction. There was a lot of warring ideologies, and that next generation, in fact, in the year 70, the temple was destroyed. And there was this key moment in Jerusalem where we, have, we go to church, essentially. We all travel to Jerusalem. Even Jesus faithfully went to Jerusalem. It was a part of his final ministry was to go to, Jer to Jerusalem. It's a place where they would call central temple worship. It's that place that you would ultimately go to, to trust that the Lord of hosts, the, the God of gods is, is here, is residing among us. But when the temple gets destroyed, your nation state gets destroyed. And when the, the nation state gets destroyed, it means that, that you don't have a center. You don't have that one barometer or that one uh, anchor that's holding you. You don't have any measurement of where your center is. You've lost. You've lost something dear to you. Imagine being in a, in a tumultuous time around 70. And beyond, where you're, you're, you're a new fact, you're a new sect, you're a new uh, way, trying to be a quote-unquote church. There's no word church yet. But you're a ragtag group of revolutionaries that claim Jesus. And, and you, you're trying to follow in this way, but everything around you, the Roman Empire, this new imperial government that claims that their leaders are God, and they call their leader the Son of God, it is right near you all the time. And is, is next to you, and is, is culturally, you pray not for the kings, you pray to the kings. And imagine if you were also living in a time and a place where there was this sect of Christianity, a, a stream, if you will, that was going through the faithful.
called Gnosticism. And what it really just translates as having knowledge. The elite among you. Those that were more evolved academically. They spent more time. God gave them a higher knowledge than others. And imagine being around a time or a place where you heard uh, word that there was sort of a, a group of people that just knew more than you. And they knew right from wrong better than you. And they moralized loudly and confidently. And, and, that, and that you were to take notes of their wisdom. You certainly weren't to resist it or to, to question it. You were to adopt it. And, and if anything, maybe perhaps you could sit at their feet the way that the disciples sat at the feet of Jesus. And just bask in the parable and the glory that is emanating from their mouth. So Paul writes a letter to Timothy. And in the very beginning, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and the Christ of Jesus, our hope to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Get ready for a letter. He says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths, and to endless genealogies. You see, in Christ, we, we, we don't have the same type of lineage that other people are saying, this, this higher evolved stream of consciousness. You have to be born into it. Some can enter in if you so adopt the correct ideals of the day. But many of you, unfortunately, are not educated enough to be in such a club. These promote controversies rather than God's work, Paul says. He says, rather than God's work, which is by faith, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turn to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Can you imagine being in a time and a place where, where you got a letter like this and it gave you just one person spoke out in the masses that said, these do not know what they speak. It would be like shattering glass. It would be a, a resounding gong in the middle of a quiet prayer, right? What did you say? Later in the, the first chapter, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer, this is Paul, and a persecutor, I was a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to say, if anyone's a sinner, I'm it. If anyone's a betrayer, even a murderer, even someone that has completely missed the plot, it was me, let me tell you. And is there a better spokesperson for this thing called the gospel of Jesus than someone who has completely had their heart do a 180? Seeing the light, literally, walking on the road to the mess. Seeing the light of, and Christ saying, well, why are you doing this to my people? Why are you doing this to me? And coming to the knowledge that this, there's something bigger going on here than temple worship, than Gnosticism and the elites of the day who are telling us exactly what and where and how to believe. That there's something going on that, that even the, the little clans, even the folks outside of the center can come to the same knowledge and truth of God. That's why in, in uh, 1 Timothy, but now let's stop listening to this, but, but this is why. 
The other thing is, uh, a part of that same imperial or empire, uh, Caesar, Greco-Roman understanding, you had many gods. Polytheistic community of worship, that was a typical thing. The god of thunder, god of war, god of water. This god, that god, pray to this one, pray to that one. And the leaders were considered gods among men. So you didn't pray for them, you prayed to them. And you prayed to them because you pray that your leader would be a good leader, like a good God, watching over you. But this letter says pray for kings. And all who are in high positions said that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. It's like, oh, you're not going to be leading a quiet and peaceable life if you start talking like that. And he says, first of all, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. That's how we started this whole verse. Well, those would have been made in the central tem temple worship. Those were ritualistic practices that were done in a particular way within the temple. There is no more temple. So he says, made for everyone. Even the people that aren't elite, even the ones outside of Jerusalem, even the people that couldn't trek here, even the people that, that uh, but isn't that dangerous? What, what if they start going and thinking that God is that one God for them, even there, and they don't have to come here, and they don't, what if they don't have to listen to us anymore? We have a Savior who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge and the truth. Other people were saying only some can have knowledge and only some can truly know the truth. But Paul knows. Paul knows because he's seen the light that even those that have strayed the furthest can have the knowledge of the of a redeeming Savior and can know the truth of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and even those that don't live in the center, that don't have that same magistrate court and that same ruling empire directly there, even they have access to the one true God. Even they have uh, an opportunity where you are in your private life. You can offer supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings. You don't need what you thought you needed. This was revolutionary. This was, this was, I mean, and if you can imagine the, what that must have felt like for the people, this was freeing, not to the kings, but we're going to pray for our leaders. They're not gods. There's one God. And the, the other thing about Gnosticism is they believe that Jesus, well, not only was he not really resurrected, they, but they believe that he was not fully human. He was all God. He wasn't human. He can't be divine, and, and make, which makes sense if you have, have knowledge and you are an elite type of person. Certainly the things you believe, you possibly couldn't possess. It's not human. It's fully divine. And the Christians knew these, these new folks of the way that followed after Jesus, they said, yes, but there's something amazing about being fully divine and fully human in one body. And we know that we were made in the image of God. And Jesus told us that we have that image of God in us. And that we have it already and we don't need this. We don't have to adopt it the same way. What a beautiful, revolutionary, liberating idea. And says, for there is one God. There was also one mediator between God and humankind. Christ Jesus, himself human. Fighting words. Right? <laughs> That's a, sort of anti-Gnostic language. Not to the king, or not, but for the king. That's anti-polytheistic language. 
all in one tiny little paragraph, which is just a nice letter. You thought you were just reading the Bible. <laughs> that you just, you know, you would just open up the Bible and hear some, y'all, just be nice to people. God love you. See you later. <laughs> see you next week. You know, <laughs> pay your taxes and pay, put some money in the offering. You know, see you. Know. Like, no. This is a revolutionary ragtag group of people that are trying to follow Jesus. And at any time there's a, an encroaching or an already present uh, authoritarian empire movement around you, that's, that's where Jesus' people thrive. Because they have something different that they're selling. And it's free. They, they, they're not peddling it. They don't need to deceive their followers to adopt it. They don't need to lie to them. There's no deception. It's just... See, we believe in this God that accepted even Paul and even me. We, we believe in this Jesus that, that can take any stain, any sin, and can literally go under the water and come back up reborn. He says, like being reborn, a new life in the Spirit. And then we, we believe that, and we believe that in heaven, uh, there, there's no male or female, Jew, Greek, Gentile, Samaritan, all these different ideologies and identity politicking. It's not in heaven. And so we believe that, and so we don't do it here. And we believe that in, just like uh, our fellow author of, to the Gentiles and to in Galatians, and to other folks that they say there's, there's no Jew or Samaritan or Greek or even slave or free, that you're adopted into this kingdom of God because you have breath in your lungs, and that even slaves have that same image of God, and that Christ can look them in the eye and lift them up and call them brother and sister. If that's true, then we live like that now too. And we, that's why we invite people into our homes and we, we cook them meals and Jesus washed our feet when we don't deserve it. So we started doing that for people too. People's hearts are changing and they're coming to see that they don't have to go to the same places and get privileges from the correct people to be right with God. And so, we're going to keep doing this because we believe it's right. We believe in the power of prayer. Amen? Amen. We believe, see, we start praying because Paul and others taught us to pray and we're going to pray right here, right now, wherever we are. We don't need to go there, to pray anymore. We trust that Christ has removed the veil. That Christ has removed the barriers, the divisions between heaven and earth. And then no man, no woman, no human being can create such a division. And any human being that says that you have to go through this is telling you falsity. And we're going to stick by that because we believe Jesus. And we're going to follow it. We're going to get on our knees wherever we are. And we're going to pray. Because that's who we are. And, and there was more friction that came. And follow along, guys. Because the story only begins here. And the, the journey continues. How Jesus continually invites to the table those that do not deserve to be sitting there. What does that look like for us? Who doesn't deserve to sit at your dining room table? That maybe the Lord in some weird, mysterious way is calling you to be uncomfortable for a holy purpose. To be uncomfortable for a holy reason. That maybe, just maybe, these barriers that humans are really good at lifting up and really good at finding exactly which particular people are in or out, Jesus came to knock them down and to say, there is a God. 
the Spirit is moving and breathing, if we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. And if only we could see one another the way God sees us, what would the world look like? And Jesus just lived it and looked at people and treated people the way that God sees them. That's why Jesus doesn't stone a woman who did wrong, doesn't tell her after everyone left, it's totally cool to have five, six, seven husbands. <laughs> Says, go and sin no more. But no one here condemns you, and neither do I. There's a God who is, is gracious and merciful. And is calling each and every one of us into that spirit. And if we can enter that realm, then my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you are entering into prayer. That's what it means to be in prayer. <clears throat> the power of prayer is not, God, I, I really want a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but not just any cat. <laughs> you know, like, no, the power of prayer is about saying, God, you tell me, you open the door. You invite, not I knock on the door and I invite Jesus into my life and I'll pull you out when I need you. Jesus knocks on the door and says, the door is opened to you. To come and follow Christ into Christ's kingdom. Different than inviting Jesus into your kingdom. Jesus invites us into his kingdom. And says it's here, it's ready, it's now. For any and all who are willing to repent. To see, to taste. And I promise that once you taste, you can't untaste it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. You won't want to. Come and see that the Lord is good. In the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the powerful Holy Spirit that lives among us. Amen. Amen. We're going to do our communion slightly different today. <clears throat> Especially because it is about prayer, I'm going to offer that posture that I was talking about physically. And so we're going to kneel at the altar and, and take our, our communion, uh, however many people fit at the altar at a time. And it might take us a little bit longer, but it's a little bit more worth it. Especially to do it every now and again. So I'll ask, ask those from the, the back to come first. Um, but then those that are receiving and helping to offer up our, our communion elements in just a moment. But Jesus offered the table not just to those elites. He offered it to Peter. A fisherman who was impulsive. And got things wrong and, and interjected and, and said things at the wrong time in the wrong place almost his whole life. You like that, Belle? Same. Yeah. Same. <laughs> uh, he sat and he broke bread with Peter and James and John, with Matthew. And different people that came from all these different perspectives. And they, they came to the Lord. To the Lord's table. And Christ said, take, eat. This is my body. It's broken for you. It's given for you. It's a sharing. Do this in remembrance of me. Each and every time you eat of it. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, Drink from this all of you. This is my cup of the new covenant. No longer will we need the old covenant, the old ways of central temple worship covenant. I'm the new covenant. And all who come to the Father through me will find life. Drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And God does the forgiving, not people. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The table, the altar, Jesus is open. This is a complete invitation to any and all. You do not need to be a member of Coke's Chapel. You don't need any barrier, uh, any human barrier. This is Jesus inviting you. So come one, come all. Come to the altar, uh, and we'll start at the back and slowly move. You're invited. And I'll ask those helping to assist.
close our service. Number 428, for the healing of the nations. We'll sing the last verse.